Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Captain Jake Bailey from Secretary of the Air Force Public Affairs. Thanks for joining us here today. In just a moment, Major General John Pletcher, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Budget, will provide the Department of the Air Force FY21 budget overview briefing. If you are unable to pick up a packet of our budget materials, please let myself or another staff member know and we'll get that to you. Following the briefing, Major General Pletcher will be taking your questions. In the interest of time, we ask, and, and so that we can get us through as many as possible, we just ask that uh, you limit that to one, and including one follow-up. Uh, if, if we can, we'll get through a subsequent round, if possible. Um, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Major General John Pletcher. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and thanks for attending the Department of the Air Force's FY 2021 uh, President's Budget Rollout Briefing. This is uh, kind of exciting for us, so thanks for being here. Go we'll jump in the next slide, please. Here's what I'll cover in today's briefing, but let me start by giving you the bottom line up front. This budget requests $169 billion for the Department of the Air Force to maintain our readiness gains of the last three years, while also further aligning our department to what is asked of us in the National Defense Strategy. This budget invests in the necessary capabilities we must develop to counter the projected threats and continues to build the air and space forces the nation needs. And of course, one unique feature of this FY21 budget is that it includes the first separate budget request for the recently established United States Space Force. Let's start by taking a look at the strategic environment. Next slide, please. As you're aware, the international security environment continues to change in dangerous ways. Peer adversaries such as China and Russia continue to employ aggressive tactics to coerce neighbors, suppress dissent, and undermine freedom. These actors are developing or are already in possession of technologies that fundamentally alter the calculus of future conflict. Combined with the threats posed by Iran, North Korea, and violent extremism, we face an unpredictable future with challenges across every warfighting domain. To address these threats, the fiscal year 21 budget takes calculated risk in near-term capacity and select legacy platforms to invest in the key capabilities we need to mitigate unacceptable capability gaps in a future fight. And make no mistake, the threat extends into space, and winning any future fight will require us to win in space. So with the establishment of the United States Space Force, the FY21 budget includes the first ever separate Space Force budget request, a key step in the effort to aggressively develop the necessary space capabilities, warfighting doctrine, and expertise required to outpace the future threats. The future of our department comes down to this. Our adversaries have designed their forces to exploit our vulnerabilities, and unless we evolve, they will someday face a force they have readily trained and equipped themselves to defeat. We cannot allow that to happen. This FY21 budget request reflects our current thinking about the future air and space forces the nation and the Joint Force need to close those vulnerabilities. With this request, we're investing in an integrated design and modernized forces that can pursue four, our four design priorities shown at the bottom left of the slide. At the same time, we're continuing to provide combatant commanders with ready forces and the critical capabilities necessary to conduct the enduring missions shown at the bottom right of the slide. Of course, it's our greatest asset, our people, that underpins all these efforts. Developing and caring for them and their families remains our enduring imperative. Next slide, please. Strong bipartisan work by Congress and the President led to the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2019 that set national defense spending levels for fiscal years 20 and 21, providing the stability and predictability so critical in resourcing our national defense priorities. And with the passage and signing of the FY20 National Defense Authorization Act and Defense Appropriation Bills in late December, we've been able to continue our focus on advancing the readiness and lethality of our air and space forces. This continuing congressional support and our ongoing reform efforts, which I'll talk about in a moment, are instrumental in maintaining the readiness momentum of the past few years and achieving the modernization goals called for in the NDS. This journey began in fiscal year 18, where with the increased top line provided by the President and Congress, we were able to halt the readiness decline caused by sequestration and 26 years of continuous combat operations. In fiscal year 19, we continued the recovery, increasing readiness across multiple fleets and mission sets, and began aligning our modernization efforts to the newly established NDS. And the budget we're executing in FY20 enables us to further advance readiness, innovation, and modernization in line with the return to great power competition. Now, in FY21, to build the future air and space force we need, we did a comprehensive review of our portfolios and made tough choices. 
to build the most capable force against a projected threat within the available top line. The capabilities we're building, some of which I'll now highlight, allow us to pursue an integrated design and field modernized forces that are necessary to achieve irreversible momentum toward NDS implementation, as called for by the Secretary of Defense. Next slide, please. In this slide, we've captured key programs in this year's budget, a few of which I'll highlight, organized by the Secretary of Defense budget themes. You can also see beneath each category where our Department of the Air Force investment areas are aligned to the Secretary of, De of Defense themes, all of which are ultimately resourced to build a ready all-domain joint force. Let me start in the center. Modern warfare is increasingly all-domain, and to prevail, any future force must move beyond deconflicted operations and be able to employ true joint all-domain operations, creating simultaneous dilemmas that overwhelm an adversary. The foundation to successfully executing joint all-domain operations is the ability to network all forces into an effective whole or connect the joint force. The key to this is Joint All-Domain Command and Control, or JADC2 as we call it, which will bring together sensors, systems, and weapons from different services and nations to allow the seamless sharing of information and the convergence of combat power. The, the Department of the Air Force is driving the conceptual development of this common architecture, so our FY21 President's budget puts $302 million toward accelerating the development and operational demonstrations of the Advanced Battle Management System, or ABMS, which is a family of systems that will share real-time data connecting the right sensor to the right shooter in any domain. Now to the top left, where we focus our attention on prioritized NDS investments. Winning the future fight will require us to dominate space through the development of resilient, defendable capabilities under the newly created U.S. Space Force. Those capabilities include $2.3 in FY21 to continue one of our key unclassified capabilities, the rapid development of the next generation overhead persistent infrared, or OPIR constellation, which will replace the, next, the current space-based infrared system, or SIBRS, to provide missile warning and battle space awareness that is more resilient and survivable against emerging threats. And as we maintain our commitment to a credible and effective nuclear deterrent for the Joint Force, we continue our recapitalization efforts for the two legs of the nuclear triad we operate, the B-21 Raider to replace the aging bomber fleet and the ground-based strategic deterrent, which will replace the Miniman III intercontinental ballistic missile. Looking at the top right, this budget also enhances our competitive edge against a peer adversary by generating combat power. We remain committed to the F-35 as the anchor of our fighter force through the procurement of 48 new F-35As in FY21 and the continuing development of the next generation air dominance capabilities. And since we know we'll have to generate that combat power in a future battlefield that is dangerous, dynamic, and dispersed where our logistics will be under attack, we're investing to reinvent logistics. For example, in FY21, we're putting $148 million into prototyping directed energy solutions for defending our bases. Transitioning to the bottom left, you'll see that we continue on our prior year efforts to modernize for increased all-domain lethality, providing ready forces that can carry out the most fundamental mission of the armed forces, defending the homeland. We're doing this by requesting an additional 12 F-15EXs to replace our aging F-15Cs, by developing advanced sensor capabilities for F-22s, and by increasing the Joint Forces cyberspace capabilities. And we remain engaged worldwide as we counter violent extremism in the most efficient manner possible. In that light, the FY21 budget funds 60 combat lines of MQ-9s and sustains our commitment to the Air Force's most effective close air support platform, the A-10, with $161 million to continue the re-winging and avionics upgrades. And finally, on the bottom right, we remember that it's our people, with the unending support of their families, that accomplish the mission. They're our greatest asset, asset and we're committed to continuing the investment in their training and well-being. With this budget, we advance our pilot training next and True North initiatives and continue our emphasis on family programs to include funding for increased oversight of our privatized housing, reinforcing our commitment to safe and habitable homes for our people. Underpinning every other theme, we recognize our responsibility to continue business reforms to maximize the value of every taxpayer dollar, and we've worked hard to resource this future force smartly, taking measured risks now to ensure we avoid unacceptable capability gaps in the future. So let's take a look at the process we used to get here. Next slide, please. 
As part of the FY21 budget process, we conducted an exhausted zero-based review looking at every program in the Department of the Air Force budget to see how it advances the NDS priorities. After assessing the results of multiple complex war game scenarios with a myriad of different combinations of capabilities and concepts, we found that winning in the future will require investing in the right new capabilities now. And with a set top line, that means trading some of the old in favor of the new. Those difficult trades are the source of funding for many of the critical technology and capability investments that are funded in this budget. The tough decisions in this FY21 budget include retiring some of our aircraft earlier than planned, knowing that we're already developing or fielding replacement platforms, as is the case with 16 KC-10s and 13 KC-135s we divest in FY21 as we continue to procure and accept deliveries of the KC-46. We're also retiring the 17 least capable B-1s, but we'll keep the maintainers in the force to drive up the readiness of the remaining B-1 fleet until the B-21s can begin to replace these aging bombers in the mid-2020s. Additionally, we take measured near-term capacity risk and other select platforms to source the funding required to develop the integrated future force capabilities we'll need to win. This budget request prioritizes intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or ISR, capabilities that are more adaptable, more survivable, and less manpower intensive, which is reflected by the divestiture of four Block 20 and 20 Block 30 Global Hawks while still continuing our RQ-4 Block 40 modernization and sustainment efforts. To offset the Block 20 retirements, we'll buy additional E-11s to meet the, addition, the Battlefield Airborne Communications Node, or BACON mission. And the signals and imagery intel mission will continue to be accomplished by the U-2 as well as space-based capabilities. Along these same lines, this budget ceases our government-owned contractor-operated MQ-9 lines, reducing our total MQ-9 combat lines from 70 to 60, while still maintaining sufficient quantities of MQ-9s to support combat operations. Finally, while we invest in the A-10 modernization discussed on the previous slide, we're also continuing on the path we set last year to retire 44 of the oldest and least ready aircraft en route to a completely modernized and combat-capable fleet of 218 A-10s in seven squadrons that will continue to fly through the 2030s. In addition, we're continuing to create trade space through innovation and better business practices. For example, the success and advances in the Pilot Training Next program are providing a faster, more cost-effective way to produce pilots. And once completely employed, this initiative will enab enable other efficiencies and savings down the road, such as potentially retiring the T-1 as a training platform, avoiding the operating and sustaining costs for that fleet. Furthermore, we continue our logistics enterprise optimization, which has consolidated or eliminated 178 systems to date. Through these reforms, we've realigned $4.1 billion across this FIDEP. And finally, we've made significant strides toward <laughs> meeting our audit goals. In 2019, we conducted our second full financial audit, and the results show significant progress in a number of areas, including inventory controls. In 2020, as we kick off the third iteration of this full financial audit, We'll continue the focus on modernizing our business systems and aggressively working the corrective action plans to close audit deficiencies as we continue our journey to achieve an unmodified opinion. Now let's begin to break down the FY21 <coughs> budget request. Next slide, please. Throughout the rest of the slides, you'll see three sets of numbers. With the FY20 presence budget request on the left, the FY20 enacted position in the middle, and the FY21 presence budget request on the right. We did that to provide context, but most of our discussion will focus on the differences between the FY20 enacted and the FY21 request. The stacked columns here show the department-wide breakout in this manner, representing the total force budget request to include active, guard, and reserve. Looking at FY21, when we exclude the $38.2 billion non-blue pass-through, the department's budget request is $169 billion, which is a $900 million increase from the FY20 enacted position, essentially flat. However, it is worth noting that the FY20 enacted position includes $3.5 billion for disaster recovery. The most obvious change in the FY21 request is the breakout of the first separate budget for the newly created U.S. Space Force, shown in the pies on the right. Most of the $15.4 billion request is transferred from previously controlled Air Force appropriations to new Space Force appropriations. Additionally, as part of a department-wide decision to comply with the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2019, $8.9 billion of our base O&M requirements will be funded in the Overseas Contingency Operations Account. This is not reflected in the above chart in order to show an apples-apples comparison from the FY20 enacted position. 
Now, before I get into the details of the individual appropriations, let me take a moment to highlight the significance of the first U.S. Space Force budget. Next slide, please. Our potential adversaries are actively devising ways to deny our use of space in a future conflict. And as I said before, winning a future fight will require winning in space. So on December 20th, 2019, we made history as a department, as a military service, and as a nation when the President and Congress established the U.S. Space Force as a co-equal and separate military branch under the Department of the Air Force. By standing up and separately resourcing the Space Force, we're enabling the future, one in which America has a centralized and equal service to recruit, train, and equip experts that can defend our space interests from peer adversaries. We'll continue to work with the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the other services to align and unify DOD space activities into the Space Force while using existing Air Force infrastructure and support to avoid duplication of effort. In future budgets, space efforts from other military services will consolidate under the Space Force. And we also anticipate the gradual integration of space acquisition authorities and activities beginning with the transfer of the Space Development Agency in FY22. One of the first requirements is establishing a separate U.S. Space Force budget, which you see on the bottom right of this slide. This FY21 request consists of four appropriations and we anticipate transitioning the military personnel funding in a future budget once we can ensure a seamless transition of pay for our space professionals. As you look at these numbers and the numbers on the subsequent slides, it's important to remember one thing. In the FY20 and previous budgets, all of our space funding was in the Air Force appropriations. However, in order to provide you with an apples to apples comparison between FY20 and FY21, we normalize the FY20 columns, moving space program funding out of the U.S. Air Force lines and into the U.S. Space Force lines. With that normalization, you can see that this FY21 Space Force budget request also represents a $900 million increase over FY20, the fourth straight year of growth in overall space funding. And finally, what's not included in this table, although we'll talk about it in the rest of the slides, is the extra support that the Air Force will continue to provide in areas such as base operating support and facility sustainment, something we'll call blue for space. Now let's get into the details of each appropriation for our Air Force and Space Force budget requests. Next slide, please. On each of the appropriation slides, you'll see a similar format where we'll include a funding table that shows the overall department budget broken by Air Force and Space Force. And as a reminder that FY20 numbers have been normalized, moving space program funding to the U.S. Space Force budget line to provide that apples to apples comparison. You'll also see key budgetary highlights for each branch with Air Force on the left and Space Force on the right. Our operations and maintenance or O&M appropriation is our largest account, making up 36% of our 20, FY21 department wide base budget requests. This account finances our day to day operations and is critical to our continued efforts to sustain readiness. As you can see, our U.S. Air Force FY21 O&M request increases by $3.2 billion over the FY20 appropriation. This is largely driven by three things. First, there's nearly $750 million in growth for civilian pay raises and directed increases in civilian retirement fund contributions. Second, there's $784 million more for the flying hour program to fund 1 million peacetime flying hours needed to train and hone our combat proficiency. And third, there's a $1.7 billion increase to our Weapon System Sustainment, or WSS, portfolio, driven mostly by a difference in the OCO and base accounting between FY20 enacted and the FY21 budget request. In total, this funding keeps us on track to sustain our target readiness gains. Within this appropriation, we also continue to build our digital net network, exploring the scalability of the enterprise IT as a service efforts that are critical to our connected joint force priority with the ultimate goal of leveraging industry best practices that will allow our people to focus on war fighting rather than maintaining networks. And we're resourcing our operational JADC2 programs such as the new multi-domain warfare officer schoolhouse and shadow operations center, where we're integrating emerging technologies into live flying operations. We've also prioritized our people with investments across our U.S. Air Force and U.S. Space Force units. For example, we're putting an additional $51 million into our True North initiative, making sure our high-tempo, high-risk men and women have access to the embedded healthcare professionals they need. And we continue to prioritize our youth, MWR, and off-duty education programs. Our U.S. Space Force O&M request includes $2.5 billion for everyday space activities, $1.3 billion of which is for weapon system sustainment. 
This request also provides the resources for the new U.S. Space Force Headquarters organization and funds about half of the civilian authorizations transferred to the U.S. Space Force in FY21, with remaining civilians funded within the U.S. Space Force RDT&E appropriation. Finally, as mentioned earlier, the Air Force O&M request includes Blue for Space funds that provide support to the U.S. Space Force. For example, the Air Force O&M request includes Facility Sustainment Restoration and Modernization, or FSRM, funding to sustain and modernize our existing facilities across both our Air Force and Space Force bases. We also fund installation support costs, such as utilities and refuse collection, for both services from within the Air Force O&M budget request. In summary, this O&M request enables the Department to sustain readiness and care for our people while resourcing the daily operations of both our Air and Space Forces. Next, we'll look at our military personnel appropriation. Next slide, please. In the FY21 budget request, the Department's total military end strength continues but slows the growth of the past few years. Our FY21 total force military end strength, which includes both U.S. Air Force and U.S. Space Force, Active Guard and Reserve is 512,100 members, an increase of 1,500 over the FY20 programmed end strength. Included in 512,000 end strength figure is 6,434 military authorizations for the U.S. Space Force. Those authorizations, along with the civilian billets that transfer, will bring our U.S. Space Force to a total of about 10,000 personnel in FY21. This budget also includes a 3% military pay raise, a 3.3% increase to basic allowance for housing, and a 2.3% increase to basic allowance for subsistence. The slowing of our overall end strength growth is primarily a reflection of the fact that we were able to repurpose some of the manpower associated with the force structure divestitures I highlighted earlier, reducing the need for total end strength growth in FY21. With the repurposing and modest growth, this budget mitigates shortages in some of our operational squadrons, as well as in our space career fields, most of which are now aligned under the U.S. Space Force. Additionally, this budget addresses the manpower requirements needed to support the bed down of our new F-35s and KC-46s, as well as the acquisition personnel needed to support the maturing B-21 program, and the manning needed to support our developing JADC-2 capabilities. These combined efforts meet our current priority manpower needs while keeping us ahead of the manpower investments required to support the future fight. Next, I'll turn the, our attention to the Department's Research, Development, Test, and Evaluation, or rdt &E, budget request. Next slide, please. Our Department-wide FY21 rdt &E budget request is $37.3 billion, representing the fifth straight year of significant growth in our rdt &E accounts, and a $2.1 billion increase over FY20. As you can see, the Air Force rdt &E, Air Force rdt &E request is $26.9 billion, and the Space Force rdt &E request is $10.3 billion which is by far the largest share of the overall Space Force FY21 budget. In the Air Force rdt &E request, we're invested heavily to connect the joint force with a funding request of $302 million for the Advanced Battle Management System, a more than two-fold increase over FY20. This funding will develop the network on multiple fronts through rapid iterations, creating a system of systems as we go, and conducting operational demos every four months to rapidly integrate lessons learned. Also in the Air Force request, we continue our recapitalization of two-thirds of the nuclear triad with $2.8 billion going into the B-21 program and $1.5 billion to further the development of the ground-based strategic deterrent. Additionally, our commitment to next-generation air dominance continues as we capitalize on non-traditional acquisition strategies and resource the most promising technologies needed to close future air superiority gaps. Finally, this request includes $801 million to advance a VC-25B presidential aircraft recapitalization effort, as well as additional funds for testing of the recently named T-7A Red Hawk and funding to continue our prototyping efforts of the hypersonic air launch rapid response weapon. Turning to the Space Force rdt &E budget, while a portion of this request is classified, the $10.3 billion does include a planned increase for the next generation overhead persistent infrared program that I mentioned earlier. This request also includes funds for the next generation GPS operational control system, a ground component that will allow secure command of both modernized and legacy satellites. As a combined portfolio, the Space Force's rdt and &E budget invests to protect and defend our current space assets to build more resilient and defendable architectures and to develop offensive capabilities and options to respond if our national security space capabilities are threatened. 
This total Department of the Air Force rdt &E request continues our commitment to rapidly developing the technologies and capabilities that combatant commanders will require from their future air and space forces. Now let's take a look at the highlights of our procurement appropriations. Next slide, please. The department's combined procurement funding request remains relatively stable again this year with the exception of our munitions account, which we'll discuss in a moment. At the macro level, the Air Force F FY21 procurement request total is $22.9 billion and a Space Force procurement request total is $2.4 billion. Within the Air Force procurement budget, this FY21 request includes $5.8 billion to procure 48 F-35As, which is the same number as our FY21 or FY20 PB request, but less than the FY20 enacted quantity as we were thankful to receive an additional 14 F-35As from Congress in the FY20 authorization and appropriation bills. This FY20 request also includes $1.4 billion for an additional 12 F-15 EXs to replace our aging F-15Cs. Additionally, we continue to recapitalize our tanker fleet with 15 KC-46As and fund the recap of our rotary fleets with $1.2 billion for HH-60Ws and $212 million to start low-rate initial production of the MH-139s. In FY21, we're able to reduce the procurement quantities of some select munitions, like the Joint Direct Attack Munition or JDAM tail kits, and a small diameter bomb or SDB-1. The significant munition buys that Congress has supported in prior years, along with reduced expenditures of certain munitions, has increased our inventory of several preferred munitions and has us on a path to achieve inventory objective levels in the next few years. At the same time, while we continue a lower level of preferred munitions buys, we begin to shift the development procurement prioritization to munitions that will be demanded in a high-end fight, such as a joint air-to-surface standoff missile extended range, or JASM ER, and long-range anti-ship missile, or LRASM. Turning your attention to the Space Force procurement request, we continue to focus on our enhanced GPS-3 constellation, buying two satellites this year to continue to increase the accuracy and resilience of GPS for both military and civilian users. We're also funding three national security space launches in this budget to assure continued U.S. access to space. Finally, this budget includes $105 million for launch vehicle integration for the two final space-based infrared system satellites to maintain our legacy missile warning capability until the next generation OPIR capability is on orbit. Having high highlighted the changes in our procurement funding lines, let's take a quick look at our major procurement quantities in the FY21 budget. Next slide, please. On this slide, we show the procurement quantities funded from both base and OCO across FY19, FY20, and FY21. I'll briefly pause here to allow you to review the numbers on this chart. Next slide, please. Similar to military personnel, our military construction budget request supports both the Air Force and the Space Force, even though all of the FY21 funding has been requested in the Air Force military construction appropriation. This is another example of the blue for space support I mentioned earlier. The first thing to point out here is that the total funding from FY20 to FY21 is not an apples to apples comparison. As you can see, almost half of the FY20 funding was disaster recovery dollars to rebuild the bases affected by natural disasters, primarily Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida and Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. Thanks to tremendous congressional support in FY19 and FY20, we don't have, or we have the funding necessary to fully rebuild those devastated bases, which is why you don't see any FY21 requests from the Air Force for disaster recovery. Excluding the disaster recovery funding in FY20, you can see that our military construction request goes down from FY20 to FY21. Like the select legacy divestitures I mentioned earlier, military construction is another area where we're taking risk in FY21 to accelerate the development of the critical capabilities we know are needed to defeat a peer adversary in a future fight. However, even with reduced overall funding, we prioritize planning and design funding in this FY21 request to ensure that the projects we budget for in FY22 and beyond will be ready to execute. This year's request also prioritizes new mission bed downs, including our F-35 and T-7A simulator projects and our highest priority improvement projects for existing missions, such as the basic military training dorms at Lackland Air Force Base. Finally, this budget request funds the new mission bed down of the Space Control Facility at Anderson Air Force Base in Guam, as well as the final phase of the Consolidated Space Operations Facility at Shreveware Air Force Base, 
which will house the staffs of the Joint Task Force Space Defense and National Space Defense Center. Most importantly, we remain fully committed to addressing the quality of life concerns for our people and their families, reflected in the FY21 funding to continue the 218 additional positions in our military family housing offices to oversee the execution of our privatized housing contracts across all of our bases. That was the final base budget account. So let's take a look at the OCO slides. Next slide, please. Similar to our FY20 President's budget request, this year's budget includes three categories of OCO funding, direct war costs, enduring OCO requirements, and OCO for base. The first traditional OCO category is OCO for direct war costs, which includes combat or direct combat support costs that will continue once combat, or will, will not continue once combat operations end. The second category is OCO for enduring requirements, which includes requirements previously funded in OCO for in theater and in colonist activities that will likely continue even after combat operations cease. This year, our Air Force budget in these two categories funds counterterrorism operations, builds our deterrence infrastructure in Europe, replenishes munitions that have been used during operations, and buys H 860Ws to replace three combat rescue helicopters that we lost in combat. You'll also note a small amount of Space Force OCO requirements, specifically $77 million for counter space operations, satellite communications in support of our overseas efforts, and the sustainment of our space-based infrared system. Finally, this budget includes $8.9 billion in the Air Force's OCO for base category, which funds traditional base budget requirements, specifically weapon system sustainment. Now, to be transparent, we also included this $8.9 billion in the previous l &M slide to enable us to show you an apples-to-apples -apples comparison between FY20 and FY21. But the funding for this requirement will be requested in the OCO portion of our budget. Let me close with a few final thoughts. Next slide, please. As the National Defense Strategy warns, without a clear commitment to modernizing our military, we will rapidly lose our military advantage and be left with a force that relies on legacy capabilities that are irrelevant against the future threat. This FY21 budget builds toward the future air and space forces that combatant commanders will need to win against any adversary across all domains. Our request was driven by an imperative to invest not just in quantity, not just in near-term capacity, but also in quality to develop the integrated joint force capabilities that tip the balance of future power decidedly in the United States' favor. To that end, we made tough choices, taking calculated near-term capacity and infrastructure risks to advance the survivable and effective capabilities of the future. And we've built the first ever budget request for the United States Space Force, a critical step on the path to space superiority. As we look to the future, we'll continue to make difficult trades to avoid unacceptable capability gaps in the out years while preserving the readiness gains we've worked hard to achieve. But we cannot do this alone. We ask Congress and our stakeholders to embrace these tough choices now to partner with us in achieving irreversible implementation of the national defense strategy to help us become the air and space forces that our nation needs. Thank you very much. I welcome your questions. Thank you, sir. Brian. Uh, Brian Everson of the Air Force Magazine. I was hoping to touch on a couple of aircraft inventory questions. Okay. First, on tankers, um, the Air Force has said it doesn't expect KC-46 to be deployable for another three to four years, prompting AMC and Transcom to ask for more time with KC-10s and KC-135s. How can you meet the tanker lines needed if these retirements do go through? And on the B-21, the appendix shows one B-21 entering the TAI this year. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, I'll answer the B-21 issue first. That's just an error. We don't have any, any inventory entering. So I know it caught everyone's attention. I wish we would have caught it before it went out, but there isn't any, any inventory in, in FY21 for B-21s. Uh, on the, in, or on the uh, capacity issue for tankers, like, like I said in the briefing, the bottom line is to, to try and ensure we have the capabilities that we're going to need in the future, we're going to have to take some risks. We can't continue to, to fund everything today uh, that, uh, that we do and that, that we have in our force today without have eventually having to make some tough choices. So this budget does that. It allows us to say, make some choices in terms of the capacity we have. Essentially, what, what we talk about is, you know, what do you, what do you compare or how do you compare the 2030 demand for the combatant commanders today, which is 2030 on the clock, against a 2030 calendar, which is the future capability we're going to have to have against China and, and, uh, and Russia. And if we continue to focus only on one of those two, something has to give. So the risk we take in the ca capacity for tankers essentially is what we consider acceptable risk, given that we never go below the 479 total tankers available. 
uh, and it allows us to, even though we're, we don't have full uh, capability on the KC-46 yet, it allows us to continue to do the testing that we want to do so when we can complete those uh, fixes in the, in the tanker that we're fully able to, to, to make those uh, fully mission capable and get started immediately. Courtney. Hi, yes, Courtney Alvin with Inside Defense. Um, I wanted to ask about the zero-based review. Um, General Goldfein had said in the past that uh, the Air Force identified like 30 billion across the FIDIP. Um, the slide said this budget only includes a 4.1 billion dollar shift across the FIDIP. What, what's the reason for that? Um, why weren't you able to get to the 30 billion? Yeah, the, there, we got. I got to make sure I give you clarity on what the 4.1 rep represents. The 4.1 is what is considered reforms. So in the reform element of our budget, we identified 4.1 million, or billion, I'm sorry, that we moved across the FIDEP to address some of our future requirements that we need. Uh, in the Air Force building, bu or budget building process, exactly as uh, General Goldfein said, you gotta understand the total budget process. So when, when the Air Force submitted our POM, we identify a number of trades. And in that analysis, we looked at a lot of different challenging trades that really added up to $30 billion. But as you look, you go through that review process, you're not, not all those trades are going to survive. You have to consider combatant commanders' needs. They get a vote on that requirement uh, decision as well. So eventually that total 30, 30 billion ends up being something less than 30 billion that moved across the fight up. I don't know what the number is. It's a lot more than the 4.1. The two are not the same. But it's really a matter of letting the process play out to allow the, the decisions within OSD and the combatant commanders have a voice so we know what exactly we're going to can you, if you can't say the number, can you tell us what some of the things were that you had wanted to reduce that you weren't able to because of those? Uh... It's it's more of the, some of it was more of the same things you see in this budget. The, the real trade that the Air Force was looking to make was to try and accelerate as much as we could to that future force. If we're going to do that, you have to make probably more trades in near-term capacity. That's obviously, as I talked about, when you look at combatant commanders who are worried about 2030 on the clock tonight they're worried about having that capacity in place to be able to counter the threats that they have or, or address the missions they, they have. So as you'd expect, there's going to have to be a balance of what's, what we can develop in terms of future capabilities and how much risk we can take in near term versus what exactly uh, we'll have to make sure we have in terms of capacity to meet those 2030 on the clock requirements for combatant commanders. Tony. A couple quick questions. Uh, the defense-wide review talked about some of the $5.7 billion of savings will help enable significant investments, new investments in space capabilities. Can you address that? How much of the 5.7 did the Air Force get to significantly invest in new space capabilities? Unfortunately, Tony, that's the process doesn't work where they take this particular pot of money and they say let me allocate it to that particular requirement so <laughs> so the the department is trying to figure out how what what they're going to fund in terms of commitments and requirements from the services as well as combatant commanders and they're going to identify a lot of different sources to do that some of those sources come from within the air force some come from the defense wide review and then they'll eventually push the dollars that they identify in terms of sources into which items that they are going to be funded within the department. So to try and do a one-for-one -one mapping is, is just not possible. Two years ago, 386 was the goal of uh, mm -hmm. increased squadrons. I don't see any mention of that here. Did, does that, is that dead now as an issue or what? No, I'm glad you asked me that, actually. And it wasn't two years ago. It was even actually last year. Wilson brought it up two years ago. Well, but, but the study was, was part, came out about the same time our FY20 budget. So um, it is absolutely not dead. What we got to remember is what was asked by Congress that led to the 386 study. What Congress asked was, Air Force, every year you come here and tell us what you can afford within the top line available. The NDAA said, we want to know what's required to meet the NDS. That's what that study was answering, 386 squadrons. But the reality is that's an unconstrained answer. We've got to build a budget within inside the top line that the department has available. So there's still a requirement. Still, 386 is still a valid requirement. It's still where we want to go. This budget advances some of the capabilities we need, and hopefully, uh, in the end, we can continue to grow the, the cap capacity we need towards that Air Force we need as well. Thank you. Yep. Brian. Hi, sir. Oriana Pollock with Military.com. Um, I was hoping you could clarify regarding uh, disaster relief and recovery. Given how dire this funding was for the Air Force last year with Tyndall and Offutt Air Force Base, what's the current requ request allotted toward disaster relief and recovery under MILCON? In 21? Yeah. I don't have any requirement for disaster relief and recovery in 21 because of the funding that was 
allocated or appropriated to us in FY19 and FY20. So Congress essentially appropriated in FY20 all the remaining military construction needs I have to recover Tyndall and Offutt, which is great. They gave it to us earlier than I would have anticipated. So that takes that requirement off the table for FY21 for the Air Force. Okay, but are you not planning for other weather, significant weather events in the future? I can't, I, I can't submit a request to Congress for a, an unknown weather event. But the way it works, they're going to have to have a known requirement. So they, typically what they're always doing is chasing after the fact the disasters that occur. Uh, if I submit to them a wedge that says I want to have this money in case something happens, it'll probably be the first place that they have to go to source other requirements. Valerie. Valerie and Sonoma Defense News. Um, to follow up on Courtney's question um, about the $30 billion in mm -hmm. savings, if that were to have happened, how would that have impacted the investments in science and technology that the Air Force would have been able to make? So, you know, in other words, if you guys would have had that money, where would you have put it? Well, as I said, most of it was going to go to accelerating even faster to that future capability, that, you know, the Joint All Domain Command Control, the ability to connect every sensor, every shooter, uh, the ability to advance space, all the things that we think are going to be the most relevant in a future fight. So there, there's a laundry list of areas that would go to if we had more top line. You know, talking about the specific $30 billion doesn't really, is, is kind of a point in time. The, what I'm really trying to tell you is if we had additional dollars, it would be to try and accelerate that capability because we know that's what we're going to need. And for ABMS specifically, uh, the funding for that, I think, about doubled. Can right. you talk a little bit about what more is going to be happening there in FY21? Yeah, actually, it's, it's I mean, I'm sure you all have read the what, what we did in December. I think it's pretty exciting. So uh, there's a lot of different elements to it, but the way I explain it is, as we continue to do these on-ramps, and we're going to do those uh, every four months, we're going to look for more and more ways to connect capabilities, sensors, shooters, platforms that don't exist today in multiple domains. I thought the, 20, the December example or December case was a really successful case of it. And, and now it's just a matter of going to individual combatant commanders and figure out what are the next things that they want to test. We'll do another one in April. And eventually what you see us doing in 21 is continuing those on-ramps and then trying to develop under lines of effort what capabilities have the most promise so we can get those into warfighters' hands. we got time for one more question. Rachel? Hi. Um, Rachel Cohen with Air Force Magazine. Um, so last year the Pentagon said that um, you didn't expect that creating a Space Force would add more than $2 billion um, over the next five years. Do you see this request as staying on that track? Um, are you, do you think that you're on track to exceed that or come in under that now? Um, and just as a, as a clarification, for the R&D programs under Space Force, is it every R&D program that already existed under the Air Force is already moved into the Space Force request, or are you guys moving those over kind of piecemeal? The second question first. We, we, we tried to get everything, everything that was part of space, uh, both classified and unclassified, moving into the Space Force, at least what was inside the Air Force, knowing there's more work to be done than the others. Uh, the focus on the, on the growth you're talking about, in my view, if I have your question right, is really about making sure that we didn't let too much bureaucracy get in the way. And I can tell you the focus of uh, Chief Raymond has been just on that. Uh, every time they've talked about how big a headquarters, how big of additional uh, centers, anything that might look like added uh, or, or added cost that it doesn't drive to capability, he's pushed down on it. Uh, whether or not the Space Force overall grows probably depends on how much we as a, as a nation and we as a department invest in the capacity and the capabilities that are really the gain of standing up a separate Space Force. So I think you'll see a, de a desire to continue to accelerate the spa U.S. Space Force, but I think what you won't see is a desire or a, any, any growth, unnecessary growth in terms of um, uh, bureaucracy. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for today. Thank you. If you have any follow-up questions, come let myself or another staff member know, and we'll, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you.